I want to share with you guys a little bit about um, Stephen Sprague here. And um, I always got to disclose, guys, whatever projects I talk about, just assume that I'm invested in it. So uh, that way you guys know if there's any conflicts of interest. All right. So, um, so Stephen Sprague is from the, he handles the, what I call the hardware security. So in the blockchain space, uh, when I first entered it, I never had to worry so much about computer security and study about it, learn what encryption is, what cryptography is, and all this fancy you know, scientific and mathematical stuff. But uh, one of the things that, um, that we have to all pay attention to is computer security. And there's two sides to computer security. One side is the software side, and the other side is the hardware side. And as far as the hardware, um, I have not met, personally met anyone else in the industry that understands hardware security more than Steven. The, uh, the first person I met that I thought really understood hardware security um, was, um, I think his name, um, what, what was his name, the guy that opened up the Trezor? Um, oh, Carl? Yeah, Carl. Uh, he's the, uh, one of the founders of the Grid Plus. Um, project, the cryptocurrency project that is uh, working on the energy uh, field. So Carl, I read an article by him that opened, where he opened up a Trezor and then he examined it and then he was explaining how it works and he explained where the weak links were in the Trezor. Okay? Now, I have not met anybody else that I ever uh, in the crypto space that understands hardware security to that level where they can dissect a Trezor hardware wallet and be able to explain to you what each component is doing and what it, you know where the security flaws are at and based on his analysis a Trezor had to go in and fix the things that he recommended need to be fixed to increase the security. So that does not that an average human being cannot do that. You have to really know what you're doing in hardware to do that. And at a conference, I witnessed myself and a few colleagues witnessed that individual, Carl, have a conversation with Stephen about hardware security. And I, it was like the, 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 what is it, clash of the titans when it comes to hardware security. And uh, I have to say, I was very impressed with what Stephen had to educate Carl on when it came to hardware security. And we're not, Carl is not somebody you mess with when it comes to hardware security, because I don't go around opening up Trezors to see if it's well built, okay? So this is the level that we're talking about. These guys are at a very high level of hardware security that uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Steven. So welcome on, Steven. Thank you, everybody. So, so I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm not a software developer or a hardware developer. I'm a mechanical engineer, and the beauty of mechanical engineering is all the gearboxes have been designed, so we just have to know a little bit about everything, not actually very much about anything. Um, but I, I, I have employed some of the smartest people ever in trusted computing and written a lot of the specifications, and, and uh, so I'm at, I don't know, we've probably spent at least $550 million so far in trusted computing, um, just in my teams. Um, in the last 20 years, and that brought you 1.5 billion PCs with hardware security built onto the motherboard of the PC, and you're now in generation like three or four technology out of, Inter out of Intel um, based on some of the trusted computing standards, and we're on second or third generation out of ARM um, within all the handsets. There have been a billion handsets that have been shipped, um, which could have run a Trezor grade wallet in the handset. Um, so. These are technologies that have been around for a little bit. Um, have good things and bad things some days, depending on how you look at them. By the way, they were built to whole solve that whole healthcare records problem thing like 20 years ago. So we're still slaving away on that, front, on that subject. But let me talk a little bit about decentralized security. Decentralized security is a real challenge um, because everything that we've done in cybersecurity to date has been centralized. Your company runs it, some entity runs it for you, et cetera. And so when you get to decentralized security, it's easy word to write up there. It's very cool. It's a cool marketing term in the concept of blockchain. But actually implementing provable decentralized security um, is a little sporting. So why? So blockchain's cool. Blockchain is a project, and I'm going to step back here a little bit, actually, if you don't mind, because then I can also read my slides without looking over my shoulder. Um, so blockchain is cool because of all the things we heard about earlier today. You know, it's censorship proof, it's trustless, it's an immutable ledger. It's a very cool technology. By the way, the fact that it is censorship proof, 
There's a byproduct of that. It also means it's network security proof. So network security is censorship. You set up a firewall, you block traffic, you, you control ports. It's all about censorship of the data. So building a blockchain, while really sexy, means all the stuff we currently have, the multi-hundred million, billion dollar business of cybersecurity doesn't apply. So what they've done is they've built things like IBM Hyperledger, where you run a permission chain inside the castle walls so that we can reapply all that old classic 1970s enterprise architecture for security so we can watch the instructions coming in and we can block the ones that come from Moscow because we wouldn't want the Kremlin like adding transactions on the chain as fake news. So this is the problem. We know the data is immutable. We just can't tell you whether the data was intended. This is a really interesting challenge. You have to kind of test every project you read about as to whether intent of the data is important. So I can use a really simple example. Let's do a simple blockchain. What we're gonna do is we're gonna keep track of all of the ammunition in the US Army. So we got 50 people shipping ammunition and we got 10,000 people like schlepping boxes of ammunition out to the field and guys shooting it off, right? So fantastic. What happens if the Kremlin steals one key? How much ammunition do you have? We don't know. Whatever they want the blockchain to say is how much ammunition you have. Because in essence, you have a shared wallet. That was what a, a, an inventory would look like. And, and in that, you'd have transactions. You'd have you know, thousands of transactions a day in your shared wallet. And one of those keys would be not a key you control. And as a result, the data on the ledger, while all properly collected, might not be true. And so it's a really interesting challenge. There are lots of places where, like we, you just talked about HIPAA compliance, proof that the doctor actually requested the data. How do you know the doctor requested the data? Now, by the way, you're only allowed to use the chain as evidence. You're not allowed to use the Microsoft antivirus or the Oracle cybersecurity system or the video camera surveillance of the guy using the computer. Like that's not how we're securing blockchain. We thought we could secure blockchain with blockchain. And so that's really the interesting challenge. If you only have a chain, you have this transaction on a chain, you know the transaction hash is real. Anybody who's gone to Etherscan to see whether your transaction happened, you can click on a transaction hash and you can see the transaction. You just don't know whether you did the transaction or not. You can't prove that with only the data that's on the chain. So I have to redo this slide so it animates so I can do it in two steps. What we do today is just the bottom arrow. We have instructions. That's what you create with wallets, right? Wallets don't hold Bitcoin. They hold a key that allows you to sign an instruction or a message, send that message across the network, and the message, when consumed, tells it, say, move this amount of money from this account to that account, follow this script. And the blockchain network basically is a very simple smart contract, executes that script. If it's a smart contract, it can be a more complex script. But we don't know anything about the keys or the rules or the environment in which that instruction was created. Whether it was hand-coded, whether it was executed on a you know, Linux independent machine running in the closet, isolated from the core network, or you're running it on your Windows laptop with the keys stored in a text file. We just don't know, right? There's no way to know. So cool. So what we're trying to say is that actually what you want is a trusted execution environment the purpose of the trusted execution environment is to tell you what rules were enforced. A rule is like a pin number for a key. Maybe you have to call your mother in order to use your key, like a multi-sig for inside your wallet. That'd be cool, right? We could do all sorts of kinds of rules. Um, a rule could be you have to be in this room, and somehow the device knows how to detect electronically that it's in the room. So we could have a variety of different cool tr rules that the trust agent basically enforces. So what we know is the trust agent is in place, that the rules were in place, and now that a key was used. And we can store that attestation hash, which is basically a signature of the health and integrity of the device that produced the transaction and its controls, and bind it into an actual blockchain event. A year ago, October, we did our first transaction that did this. We did it on a fully modified version of Bitcoin. It was just a lab experiment. But we demonstrated that we could make a mathematically provable cybersecurity control bound into the instruction when the transaction was written to the chain. 
Very cool. By the way, this is really useful for things like IoT. Like, I sent the transaction to the drone to shoot the guy. Well, did it come from me or from somebody else? Like, it's, sorry, I was just out talking to people the other day. We were talking about AI using weapons on, on, on and it was just fantastic. Um, <laughs> it's like, we're, we're, we were talking about automatic money on machines, and they're like, well, that's simple. Anyway, it was, it was good. So, you know, what are rules? Rules are things like pins and passwords, verification of the quality of the execution. You can have all sorts of rules in place. By the way, the nice thing about rules is they're relatively invisible and machines don't mind following them. The humans might be slightly annoyed by them, but in general, these are machine rules, not human rules. You know, we don't want you to dance around three times and then push the button. We want your machine to dance around three times and then push the button. And machines don't mind following rules. What we've done is we've introduced a concept of a token to power assertion of these rules and the different kinds of environments around so we can have provable control bound into the transaction. So how do we create money on a machine that has policy that can enforce these rules or automatically verified prior to every transaction? And that, those, that, that verification is ultimately recorded on one or many different types of chains. This is not designed to be a single chain model. We're building technology that could easily be inserted into any of the blockchains and we'll eventually provide some of the um, technology to incorporate that in general chains ourselves as well as we certainly hope others will incorporate it as well. Why is this important? The stronger the quality that we can make of the protection that produces an instruction, the more valuable the data is that we can store on the chain. So if we could 10x the value of data on everybody's chains, that'd be cool. And I think that's what this really is about. You shouldn't think of this in the context of risk. This is about improving the quality of the information that we write, the provability of the information. Proof is a really interesting thing. It's, it's actually kind of a fun exercise to take any project that you're working on and then pull back a, a foot and say, okay, what really can we prove? If I only have this data as evidence, what can I prove? And, and, and we got informed in this in my previous company. We were heavily involved in self-encrypting hard drives. And when we first built the technology, we sold totally the wrong thing to the customer. And the customers all bought totally the wrong thing. They bought encryption. State of California put out a regulation in order to, like, you know, if you lose a, hip, a laptop with 100,000 HIPAA records on it, you know, you got to go stand in the parking lot, take all your clothes off, tell them you lost all the data, put it in a press release. And at the bottom it says, but if the hard drive was encrypted, you don't have to do anything. So everybody bought encryption. Turns out you don't want encryption. What you want is proof the device was encrypted when lost. Turns out that's a totally different product. And you have to like turn off all sorts of features in order to really clearly establish proof. And so it was really informative as a very simple transaction. Like storage is a perfect example of a company that does fantastic encryption across their distributed architecture network and the data is sharded and encrypted and all this kind of stuff. Proof to me you haven't lost the private key. You got any controls on that? Like, all you have is the storage chain. I got nothing else. Right? You're not using Windows Active Directory to assure the integrity of the antivirus to protect the keys in the storage network from being stolen, right? We have just the storage chain. So I don't think storage could meet HIPAA compliance today because I can't prove the credentials haven't been stolen. And so that's a really interesting challenge to figure out how you go down that path. What we're trying to do is to help assert that the greater we provide the protections and controls, the higher the value of the data is. So what's trusted execution? Trusted execution is an isolated execution environment. Its, it's real definition is a known set of inputs always produces the same output. A computer you can trust. You said, give it this data, this stuff will come out every time. Not something else you didn't really expect. Um, so it's a known computer running in a known environment. We, as an industry, branded this stuff trusted computing. It's probably the wrong word. It was great in 2001. The problem is it's really measured compute. What we're saying is this compute environment was properly measured and is properly controlled, and I can tell you what measurements were placed, and the parts that you measured actually worked. If you didn't measure a part, then who knows what you got? But as long as you measure the components and to the quality of whatever that measurement is, you should be able to make some assertions about what it's capable of doing. 
that these basically measurements are hashes, and they're cryptographically bound together in a Merkle tree. So this idea that we get a top hash that represents that these following, you know, these previous 27 steps were done to build this compute environment turns out to be really quite consistent with the whole blockchain architecture because we just end up with a hash. So this is a very simple and elegant mechanism to combine the benefits and values of the trusted computing space with blockchain. Simple thought. Tokens or coins operate chains. Trusted computing operates tokens. Think about that. Trezor is a trusted computing device. Ledger is a trusted computing device. Multisig is a trusted computing device. Right? So you want to have trusted computing operating your tokens. We don't do that very well, which is why we today use mostly online wallets, where we're doing authentication to an online service. We're trusting them not to lose our keys. Probably not the best plan, because they can steal your keys, um, and they might lose them anyway. So what's inside one of these devices? These devices were built to secure your e-commerce experience. And we'll go through the exact steps of what e-commerce is, because nobody really knows. We do it every single day, and most people can't really tell you what it is. Now, in blockchain, we're beginning to learn, because we know that like, we'd like to have a trusted display, we'd like to have some input. But these technologies exist within the device. Why? Because the European Union set standards over a decade of work into the standards bodies to require what's called Payment Security Directive 2, which is basically you should have a treasure in your house for using your Visa card. That'd be cool. By the way, it's required to be in place for all banking transactions in 2018. Guess who's compliant? Nobody. There's a great opportunity for blockchain. Maybe we could be compliant. Then we could have a really fun conversation, which is, so European Union, exactly why are you letting these banks do transactions? Because they're not compliant with your regulation. Because we're building a new payment platform. We have the opportunity for the transactions to become compliant going forward. There's an enormous opportunity out there. The consuming public, through their governments, have asked for better security in e-commerce. Because it doesn't really work. So one of our places that we're starting is with two-factor authentication. This is our first product that went live on the 31st of, um, Oct of December. And, and it's in closed beta, so there are about 100-something users of it today. And it's compatible with, I think, almost all of the exchanges that are out there today. So if you have an exchange that's running Google Authenticator or Authy, we use the same protocol. The difference is, instead of storing your seed keys in software with the same quality of security as Snapchat, we're storing your keys in the tamper-resistant hardware on the device with the same security of Apple Pay. So cool. So you should have the basic infrastructure of what it means to have a properly protected hardware seed. You're just using it with an exchange. By the way, I don't have to talk to the exchanges. They already implemented Google Authenticator or Authy support, so it just works. This is fantastic, because have you ever tried to call an exchange? First off, there's nobody home. Secondly, they're infinitely busy because they're signing up too many customers per day, all of whom have insecure access to their accounts with username and password, and now with a cute little authy, you know, Google code. And, and it, we have a blog post on our site about it, but my favorite is, if you haven't read it, it's just sport. The Kraken guys put out a um, blog post on the 40-step plan to secure your Google Authenticator on an Android phone. Emphasis on the word 40-step plan. By the time you're done, the phone is just about useless, but it's fantastic, and we agree with every step along the way. Um, the other thing that's interesting is we've actually implemented um, some of the new advanced capabilities that came out of NIST in um, June 22nd, I think it was, or 20th. Um, they published new guidance on strong authentication after a decade and a half. Um, and, and it's really, anybody who's trying to do identity or authentication or things like that, it's worth reading NIST 800-63. Um, there's two parts of it that are important. There are three parts, section A, B, and C. Section A is what you guys all think of as KYC. It's how you add attributes to an account and what attributes are. And if you think you want to you know, participate in any token sale that's doing attributes for KYC, I would read the NIST guidance. Section A is not that hard to read, and it's really quite informative. Section B is how do you protect your keys? Use primarily for multi-factor authentication, although it does include embedded credentials as well. And so things like 
PIN numbers so that the human is present when their two-factor authentication is used are parts of how you get to medium assurance two-factor authentication. Um, there's attestation in it as too. We'll come back to that next step. But the 863 stuff, um, really worthwhile reading. By the way, section C is called federated PKI. You could just replace that with blockchain, which is really cool because the federated PKI stuff, we tried that for a decade and a half. That's a headache of the first order. And that's actually one of the core answers to the question around the HIPAA compliance question of why do hospitals want to do this? Because they don't have to have the risk of the independent entities with their own keychains, with their own federated PKI trusting the other. One of the most interesting things, I worked on a project around the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. We were part of the 50 companies that were adding technology into this conversation. It took five years to do secure email. They lost the plans before we got done with the secure email thing. So. But <laughs> it's just brilliant. The, the, the problem at the end of the day was that the Boeing guys would not trust Lockheed Martin's test of a US passport. Just keep that in the back of your heads and all this KYC attribute stuff. Like they wouldn't actually trust that they, if you went to Boeing, you had to get your passport checked again. All the other identity credentials were fine, but not your passport. So what's a secure transaction? Everybody does this every time you go shopping at every single retail location you go to and you take your new chip card based card and you plug it into that little box. First step, trusted display. You don't believe what the cash register says, that's lying to you. You believe what that little black box that you plugged your card into, that has a measured trusted display. The second step is some form of user intent. Typically in this case of credit card transactions is a pin number, unless you're an American, in which case, they didn't trust us to remember PIN numbers, so we do chip and signature. By the way, nobody checks the signature. So they wanted to do this chip and signature thing, but nobody checks the signature on any of the boxes anywhere in the world. I'm not aware that they check the signature. So it's fantastic. Really, we can't remember PIN numbers? It's kind of funny to go to Europe and they're like, you do chip and what? Um, there are a billion people in Europe that know how to keep member a four-digit PIN number with their card, which actually makes it safe, and fraud's gone to basically zero for retail. Um, so trusted execution, that's what the little chip is on your, on, your chip, on your chip card. The fourth piece is interesting. The fourth piece is attestation, that the previous three pieces are working right. Because it's great that I got a little box, but who knows if somebody came along, stuck a USB device in the box, and changed all the software in the box to steal all your credit cards and all your PIN numbers and everything. Right, so they want to assure, and that's what they call PCI compliance, but we want to be able to do attestation within a transaction. So the role of attestation is how do we properly protect and assure that the capability that we're asserting was part of the transaction was actually there. This is this, how do I actually measure that the infrastructure that was in place was correctly in place, that there's no unknown software providers, that the software is properly signed, that we check all these signatures every time we do a transaction, not like when we loaded the thing or when the FedEx with the Trezor arrived. Let's do it every single time. So what we did is, as I described before, we actually built a process on the chain where this can be not only verified as a policy enforcement point, but can actually be recorded on the chain. And so this provides a really interesting capability because I can now prove that the data on the chain came from a known device in a known condition with known controls. And that cybersecurity claim will turn to be very, very valuable in this space. As we were building our prototype, what we learned was not only could we measure the internal stuff, but we could tell the trust agent in the device, ask an oracle about anything else. And so in essence, what this shows is a rivets attribute registrar or an internal external integrity is basically that Oracle. So the trusted device can do a secure handshake to an external server, like an appliance in an enterprise or a cloud service or whatever. You can ask any question you want. Say, only do the transactions if mom says it's okay. Cool, so I can put a secure messaging thing to mom's phone. Mom has to push the yes button. You're not allowed to spend any Bitcoin unless mom says it's okay. That might be a really good plan. Or you could decide, only from this room. Or we could like put a beacon on a nuclear submarine and unless you're within range of the Bluetooth beacon on the nuclear submarine, you can't do a transaction. By the way, the chain doesn't know you're on a nuclear, nuclear sub. It just knows that you have a signature that matched. 
So cool, I can make trading rooms where the trading for the transactions can only ever happen from the trading room. And then I can assert that those tests were in place before the transactions were executed. It's kind of like multi-sig, but inside your device. So now you can make all sorts of forensic claims about the quality of the data, the type of information that's aggregated. This is another transaction hash stored on the chain. And it really is just a hash, so you probably want it hooked to a whole second chain, which is the one that's controlled by the owner that actually tells you what tests were run. So I ran these 731 tests, and I achieved this hash. That hash was compared when this transaction was done, and therefore, as an owner, I can assert that all these 731 tests were done. What's the chain know? Nothing. Oh, so we do like tokenized KYC. So I know that you got a million dollar token from Citibank that says you can do a million dollar transaction, but the exchange doesn't know who you are. You're just a customer that had a million dollar Citibank KYC AML token. That'd be cool. Right? Now, if you do something bad, I can reverse the transaction. I can go look up the token and say, ah, that's Steven. And I can, in cooperation with Citibank, unmask who did the transaction. But in the rest of the time, I have no idea who did the transaction. So high assurance instructions are a really important piece of the puzzle. Whether we're doing IoT and we want to tell things what to do, you know, whether we're operating an IOTA chain and we want to make sure the transactions go across it, whether we're storing secure data on something like storage, whether we want to enable a HIPAA healthcare type environment where I know the identity of all the doctors that are involved in the systems and that they were authorized to do these transactions, the list goes on and on and on. The vast majority of your ICO tokens that are out there are expecting to have a more automated process of, of authentication these are the tools to help make that possible. One of the byproducts of that is that we can store money on a device that can be automatic. And this is really core to the principle on the long-term basis of the Rivet token. So think of this as an allowance on a device. What you want is a device that has the ability to have, I don't know, $5 to spend for VPN services or data services or authentication or a variety of different services where it doesn't have to ask you to go get your treasure out, type in the codes in order to spend a dime. Because that will get really annoying. We know what this experience is like. I'm old enough where you had like, I remember talking to my girlfriend. This was an expensive transaction where you had to put quarters in the payphone. You know, when you're like 16, that can take a lot of quarters. So this is security by design. This is security built in. Properly executed, we all know what this feels like. What's your favorite form of multi-factor authentication? All of us have one. And so just as, a, as an exercise, just think in your head at this moment of in multi-factor authentication, what's your favorite one? And then I'll bet you you're wrong. Right? So this is a good trick to bet you that you're wrong about the favorite one that you know in your head. It's the send button on your phone. You dial the phone number and push send does hardware-based multi-factor authentication with an embedded hardware security device with a multi-billion dollar infrastructure underneath it that got you those keys and manage it, and it works brilliantly. We taught mom how to use it, and we taught the kids how to use it. And it's simple, and it's embedded, and it's invisible. That's the mission. We need to get to the point where our devices will work as well as the send button. By the way, we didn't always used to have a send button. It used to be way easier to just dial the damn phone. You didn't have to push send. Like, what's the send thing for? Turns out the send thing is the authentication. So we think this is a whole new business model for cybersecurity. This is a decentralized model. We're not looking for centralized controls. We can have any controls. You can have cloud controls. You can have local controls. You can have any third party service provider providing controls. And so what we've tried to do is create a token that allows a machine with an automatic store of money and allowance to pay for the controls the owner has prescribed as rules that must be enforced before you can spend your money. And so this becomes a really interesting set of capabilities that you could do for every different token different ways. Not all tokens are the same. You know, when you want to spend $100,000, you might want some more controls in place than when you're spending $1.99 on a coffee. And, and so it's really the owner who's in control. And so we think the owner will tell their device, here's the policy for these collection of things. And, it can be as simple as a, what feels like a Quicken interface. You know, my device spent money on these 10 different services, and you, know, you want to say, well, don't spend it on that anymore. 
or spend more on this, there's some really interesting ways to accomplish this. That's gonna be one of the real challenges is sort of consumer experience of these kind of more complex models. And so take the first step. If you're involved in a project, figure out how to move the keys into hardware. Let's make this a simpler experience. Anybody who's traded any crypto has had that panic sense. Let's make that go away. Because that's not gonna work well with 100 million people. Like that, you typed in all the numbers and you got the ICO address and you're like, here's $10,000. Hmm, <laughs> click, right? Like how do you even know you got the right address? Like you got it on Skype, really? Like what are you thinking? Did you get it on Skype and on email and on Slack and on Reddit? So you got it like at least four different channels because don't get it on one, right, before you put your, in, in our case, in our pre-ICO, we had one address that somebody put two and a half million dollars on. By the way, just for fun and sport, took them three times to do the transaction right. Nobody in this space knows what they're doing. I mean, it's, this isn't, I'm not picking on any one person, but none of us know what we're doing. We're like totally making it up every step of the way. So anyway, any questions? <laughs> Excellent. What did I just say? So let me use another simple example. I'm old, right? And so the nice thing about being old is that I have a cable box. So unlike my children, who every time they want to watch video have to get out a tablet and then type in a password, and then they log into some Netflix experience and then they can watch video, I can sit on the couch and I push a button and HBO comes on. I got this box thing. By the way, if you don't pay the cable bill, the box won't show you the videos. You can call DirecTV while you're sitting in bed and give them your credit card number and the TV comes on. You don't even have to get out of bed, right? This is fantastic. So last summer, the kids, the kids were all texting in a panic. Somebody's hacked our Netflix account. This is like, so unbelievably funny. So, so we're like trying to figure out what happened because the password had changed and what's the new password and how do you recover your Netflix account? And the kids were beside themselves. Guess who hacked the Netflix account? Grandma. <laughs> so grandma had lost the password. She figured out how to log in because she knew my wife's email. And she knew, so she knew how to log into my wife's email, get the recovery password. She changed the password on Netflix. Because the kids had shared Netflix with grandma. This was brilliant. It was like the kids were all in a panic for the entire afternoon because grandma had hacked the Netflix account. And, and, and the point of this story is very simple. When we set up Netflix in their house in Florida, brilliant son-in-law transaction, if I say so myself, they had DSL, and, and I managed to get AT&T come in, replace the DSL with Fios, and the bill went down by $10. This is good for Thanksgiving. Like, Good son-in-law activity, right? You know, improve the bandwidth for the whole household. AT&T rolled a truck. Two guys came because one of the guys was being trained. And they spent two hours wandering around the house trying to test the DSL and the fiber and all this kind of stuff. And they paid a lot of attention to the television set. They paid a lot of attention to the Wi-Fi hotspot. And they left with both of those things working swimmingly. And left half the money on the floor of the, of the house. Because... There were all these other devices in the house, phones, tablets, and PCs. Every single one of those devices had embedded hardware security on the motherboard of that device, because I helped put it there. And they forgot to put an AT&T credential in those devices. So when you take your laptop to the hotel room, what do you have to do to log into DirecTV? Log in. Why? 1.5 billion PCs have a chip on the motherboard that would remember permanently in a way that can't be stolen your AT&T login. So why not? We haven't yet understood that these are networks of devices. We're just human operators. They're not networks of humans. And so we have to shift mentally from a world of humans logging in to unknown computers to all of us having personal computers that are ours. I know that sounds like a really weird term, a personal computer. But a personal computer that is mine, which it owns all the credentials to log me into all the experiences I wish to have. So I log into my device. My device logs me into the world. And all then we're asking the human to do is not remember complicated passwords, not figure out when their passwords have been stolen. We're just asking the human to notice if their device goes missing. 
and then you can take an action. But if I take your phone, you'll notice. And that's actually, yeah, we can do that in cybersecurity training. We can actually train you, like if you show up at the office and your computer's not on your desk anymore, panic. You know, either it's been stolen or you've been fired. Both are good reasons for panicking. Or you got moved to the corner office. That, I suppose, could be a good thing. There must be some questions. Yep, I think we've got some questions. I think I can articulate a question. You showed a graphic up there while you were talking about the European security requirements, and it showed what appeared to be one of these, and mm -hmm. it seemed like you were indicating that this device has those features, yep. including the trusted security module. Mm -hmm. That Yeah, you, we just went one too far. Okay, all of that's in here, including the secure, trusted security module. On pretty much every ARM processor since, I think, I think Galaxy S3, you gotta get below that, maybe S2, just as a timeline basis. You gotta get back to iPhones like two or three, kinda, like really early on. ARM, ARM put it in in like 2007 into everything built that was a cell phone grade chip. Um, well, that's the part the that's been a little... question was, how do we use it? The question is, how do you take advantage of this trust execution environment? That's the part that's been a little bit complicated because you used to have to go negotiate with your carrier. And in 2011, a startup was formed called Trustonic, which we use the software they produce. It gives us what's called a trusted execution environment OS. And so we're able to write an app that runs in their TE OS. And so we've been working hard over the course of the last three years to do that. And so what we do is provide you with a developer toolkit so you can use it. So you don't need to know all this. You can just download the Rivets toolkit and make it part of your applications. Here's an example. This phone has a two-factor authentication on it. Let's see if it'll work. That screen, you see how the screen changed to a pin pad? That pin pad screen is not drawn by the OS. That pin pad screen is drawn by the trusted execution environment. This is a commercial off-the-shelf Galaxy S6. So this screen, in theory, if you root the phone, right, any Android app, you have root control to the operating system, you can do anything you want, memory dump it, et cetera, you can't read what I type into that screen, nor can you read what's displayed on it. Oh, trusted input and output. Oh, a point of sale terminal in my hand. Oh, I could send you a telegram message that can't be read by anything. Oh, you might be able to have a keypad that you could type a telegram message that can't be read by anything. Oh, we're just getting started. Could I have drone controls so you can't intercept the drone controls? Can I have a Bitcoin wallet so you can't see what I type? It's only half a billion phones, so it's almost getting to be enough that it might be useful for everybody. Now, the problem, of course, is it's a closed system, right? It's an ARM processor, which is not an open source processor built by Samsung, et cetera, et cetera. So there's potential for holes in this, for sure. I think the answer to that at the end of the day is that what we want to do is great identity and we want to do attestation that we know it came in an operating condition from the factory. So if we discover a hole, we know it's Samsung's fault, not because somebody put malware on this. Because this is provable executing code. Or at least our attempt at provable executing code. And we'll improve it over time. Are you hiring? <laughs> Always. We're, 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 um, we have a very good team of, a, a very solid team of some of the, what I would call core developers in trusted computing that have been part of my team. Some of them work for me for many, many years. Um, but um, we're adding to that um, more blockchain expertise. We're building a company, right? So yeah, if um, we're based out of both New York and um, California, but uh, we're looking for great people who want to contribute to projects. One of the previous requirements for, I say requirements, standards for good security when you had different websites was to change your password every couple of months. How would that, how would rivets play into that? Well, so two things. One, um, the guy who um, put that guidance out there in the previous NIST guidance around strong authentication apologized for that the other day because it turns out that's actually not true. Um, and so um, if you go down, at it, they did analysis of, um, believe it or not, the Ashley Madison site, and they determined by looking at that that the vast majority of those passwords are heavily reused because people can't remember changing them all the time. Um, so, can a so the computer could change the code every time, 
I mean, like one of the things that's interesting is SIM chips today use one code in, their, in the SIM chip. What you really would like is a SIM chip that every time it changes towers, changes codes. Well, computers could do that. That'd be like, oh, like a hierarchical deterministic wallet inside your SIM chip. That'd be killer. And so now I can't track you. So today they have it. So at least when I go to a different country, it uses a different identity. It's called T-SIM or T-I-M-S-I. T-M-S-I, I think it is. Trusted M-S-I. Um, where they change it each time. But, you know, things like that. So computers are really good at changing the code all the time. Like, hey, how are you gonna, here's my algorithm of codes. Let's change the code every time. Yeah, so the, this, so the question is, doesn't that require the website to have to change it? Yes, so like I can make Bitrix more secure by giving them secure 2FA, but you really wanna make them smoking more secure? Let's get them to send you the transaction as a message on trusted display so that when you go to do a transaction, they've at, last, at least invested like 3.2 nanoseconds in programming to say let's push this message not to a totally insecure browser on a totally insecure computer running totally insecure software, and instead push it as an encrypted message to a assured measured display environment so you can confirm $100 million from this account to that account, push yes. Wouldn't you like to check that? Like, ah, oh, I could send you your ICO address through a secured channel so that you knew the channel you were, the, transaction you were investing in was actually the code you typed in. Don't assume that because you typed it into your phone or into your PC, that what went out of your PC was the same thing. That's what the hackers are doing is what's on your screen and what it sends are two different things. All of a sudden your money went to a different address. You're like, that's not the address I cut and pasted in. <laughs> there was a Brazilian hack of their e-commerce system four or five, six years ago, where on, the, on Friday they changed the bank routing numbers. So what was on the screen was this, and then they routed all the money somewhere else. And like all the money spent to the government on, on a Friday afternoon went somewhere else. It was a brilliant hack. But that's like simple thing to do in blockchain. Just to put it simply, what are the products that you are offering to common people like us, you know, and how can we really, maybe we will want to use our blockchain wallets or something. Right, so, so for, for users, Rivets will produce a 2FA app, will produce a secure messaging app. We're working on a Bitcoin wallet, but really these are intended to be demonstration apps for developers. Our real product is a set of developer tools so that everybody can incorporate these built into their products. We don't think we can build the best wallet. We shouldn't try. We should build the tools that allow everybody to build the best wallet. We don't wanna build the best messaging system. We wanna build the tools so you, you, know, you wanna go hack it up into, you know, the Whisper protocol, you can take the Rivets basic toolkit, you can modify the open source of the Whisper protocol, and then all of a sudden everything that runs Whisper can have keys held in hardware. So we're trying to pick some simple things so that, like the beauty of 2FA is I can go give it to like the CIO of Boeing, one phone, and all of a sudden his handset's more secure than everybody else at Boeing. Didn't have to change anything. And so we're looking for those early sort of very simplistic wins, not because they're necessarily huge revenue drivers, but because they can get the technology into your hands so you can say, oh, I've touched this. Well, why the hell isn't everything else working like this? Like, I've got trusted display for this stupid 2FA app. Why can't I have it for every crazy ICO transaction you've heard out there? Yes. Hang on. Hang on. How are you funding this project and how will, do developers have to pay you for the technology? Do individuals that use sure. your technology have to pay? So, so, so Rivets today, um, we did an ICO that completed in September. Um, so we launched the Rivet token. Um, we raised about $20 million in Ethereum. Uh, we've converted about $10 million of that into cash, which is what pays the rent today. Um, the resulting re remaining Ethereum is now worth $20 million. So it's like, that's kind of entertaining. <laughs> um, so we gotta love this space. Um, we also, um, as a company, we sold only um, 16, 17% of the tokens in the marketplace. We, we hold the balance in treasury. Um, so if on a long-term basis, we will both um, help fund projects with tokens, as well as continue to fund the expansion of this on a global basis with tokens as the tokens really start to engage. We don't have to trade a single additional token out of treasury ever. There's no obligation to. Um, but it provides us with access to resources going forward. As we finish the tools, what you'll see from us, you will see us at every hackathon, you will see us at every event that there's a developer at, and we will support um, 
with bounties a variety of different projects in the marketplace. I think um, it's a little early for us still on that pro in that process, but we want to fund developers to build really cool things with these tools and help offset their costs of putting them to work. So you'll see you'll see us putting our tokens to work in that basis. And that's how you get, you know, potentially hundreds of developers within a project beginning to take advantage of embedded security. And we think this is an opportunity for every project to realize, you know, they don't want to spend money on security. What they want to do is increase the value of their project. And so our mission is to show that if you add rivets to a project, we can multiply by multiple times the value of your project. Because the quality of the data and the, and the capability of the system goes up if we improve the quality of security. Think of it as a user interface. Don't think of it as security. Right? Today, we're like the New York apartment lock. There's 17 locks and a big bar and a chain. Right? What you're really wanting is the Steve Jobs door, you know, which is like white and has no handles. Right? And it just opens. And probably has a grill on the floor so that if you're the wrong person, they just electrocute you and you turn to dust and it cleans you up automatically, right? That would be an excellent Apple door, right? So something along those lines, right? You need good AI so it doesn't zap the dog. Any other questions? If not, I'll wrap it up. All right. So I think that's it. Um, all right, guys. Everybody give a uh, round of applause to Stephen. <laughs>